Let us open our Bibles on John chapter 1. The blessed gospel of the evangelist John. Some, uh, as some people say, the gospel according to St. John. We are going to look at the prologue. Today is the last sermon on the prologue of John. And we come to one of the juiciest parts of the prologue. This portion that has so much information, so much, oh, like I said, this, this truth, this blessed, blessed revelation. What a, what a crucial portion of the Bible. One of the most memorized verses in the whole world is found right here on, on this portion from verse 14 to verse 18. But we shall read the entire prologue. But today's focus will be on verses 14 to verse 18. Let us read from the beginning of the chapter. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was a true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him, but as many as received him. To them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of men, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Hallelujah. So far the reading of the word of Christ. I want to read to you a paragraph, six lines, seven lines, from Arthur Pink. The infinite became finite. The invisible became tangible. The transcendent became imminent. That which was far off drew nigh. That which was beyond the reach of the human mind became that which could be beholden within the realm of human life. Here we are permitted to see through a veil that which unveiled would have blinded us. The word became flesh. He became that no, he became what he was not previously. He did not cease to be God, but he became man. What a fantastic statement, huh? What a, what a great job Arthur Pink did in summarizing this glorious section of the Bible. Do you remember the book of Exodus? The book of Exodus chapter 33 and chapter 34. Crucial chapters. I, I'm going to be bold, and I'll say that it is very, very, very super likely that John, when he wrote this, he was thinking about Exodus chapter 33 and 34. 
just to refresh your memories, on those two chapters, we see Moses begging God, Oh God, come with your people. Oh God, be with your people. Oh God, travel with your people. And then God speaks to Moses in a place called the Tabernacle of Meeting. Literally, it was a tent. Like a stack with a cover. A tent. A simple, simple, humble tent that he called the Tabernacle of Meeting. Now, on that very, very, very simple place that maybe you and I, if we were properly trained, we could stack up the tent in, what, a few minutes? In a tent. Of course, when the full tabernacle was prepared, that would take a few men, maybe the whole day. But initially, it was just a simple tent called Tabernacle of Meeting. And the Bible says that when Moses would enter, right there on chapter, I think, 33 still, of Exodus, when Moses would enter that tabernacle, the glory of God through a smoke, through a cloud, very thick smoke, would come and be at the door of that tent. Think about that. And the Bible says that at that location, at that simple tent, God would speak with Moses like a friend speaks to his friend. What what does that mean? It means one speaks and the other one speaks, talk, the other one talks, ask, reply, reply back, and talk a bit more. That's it. Back and forth. They were having a chat. They were chatting. They were conversing on that simple tent in the middle of the desert. Another, another thing that we see on, those, on that chapter, on those two chapters, is that Moses asked God something that I don't think Moses, Moses thought that through. Moses said to God, God, I want you to display to me all your glory. I want you to reveal yourself to me without any measure. I want, God, I want the full blast of your glory. <laughs> what a crazy man. If God would have said, okay, Moses would have become dust. Like, Maybe I'm being too soft. Maybe not even the dust would stay. He would have been obliterated. The, 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 the full blast of God's glory would have. And not, not anger, not anger. I'm talking about just the glory itself. Just the glory itself. I mean, one, one good way for us to compare is, I mean, Try looking, I mean, don't try, looking at the sun without glasses on a sunny day at midday. Try doing that for a few seconds. You're going to burn your retina. You're gonna, you may permanently damage your eyes. Now, here's the glory of a created thing, the sun. And we cannot, our physicality is not able to handle just looking at it. That's something amazing for me that there are some things that just the looking of, it's too much. It's too much. And we have that. For example, maybe if you're watching a movie, there is a, maybe a gruesome scene. Or there are something, you know when the teacher would write at the blackboard with the chalk and it would have that noise like, and, and you'd be like, see, you're just hearing but you cannot handle that. You want to run away. And dear, there was Moses saying, God, show me the full blast of your glory. Then God said, oh, Moses. Moses, okay, here, here's what I'm going to do for you, Moses. I'm going to put you in the cleft of the rock, okay? I'm going to put you in the rock. And when I'm about to pass, I'm going to put you in the cleft, in, the, in, the, this, in this fissure, in this hole in the rock. I'm going to put you there. I'm going to cover I'm going to cover, and I'm going to pass by. And you see the passing of my glory. Now, you may ask me, Philippe, what exactly that looked like? I have not a clue. I I don't have a clue. But here's one thing I know. 
that it was perceptible. It was perceptible. Have you ever seen the wind? No, you have not. You have not. I guarantee you, you have never seen the wind. What you saw was the trees shaking. What you saw was noise. What you saw was dust, the dust of the street being blown. But the wind itself, you never saw. You really never saw. But your experience of that event was so real, so complete, that you, you and I are very comfortable in saying, I can see the wind. Oh, no, no, we cannot. But we perceive so many other things that it's enough for us to say, I feel like I saw the wind. Maybe that's something that Moses experienced at that time. He noticed that the glory of God passed. And then God replied, Moses, I'm going to do that. I'm going to put you inside the rock. I'm going to pass by. You're not going to see me. You're not going to see my face. For no man shall see me and live. That's what God said. Now you may be thinking, well, God is so exclusivist. God is so arrogant. God doesn't want to display himself. No, this was an act of love. For the preservation of Moses himself. And then, I think on chapter 34, we see that Moses goes up the mountain and he comes back. He, he brings a new set of tablets of stone and God imprints for him, again, the Ten Commandments. Those two chapters are very important for what we read today. We read here, Verse 17, for the law was given through Moses. That's true. God gave Moses the law. He broke it, literally, the the stones. And then he went up again and God gave him another set. And we see here on verse 18, no one has seen God at any time. No one has seen God. Not even Moses. And Moses asked. Moses said, God, Can I please see you? Another one that asked this question. He is my namesake, Philip. Philip came to Jesus and said, Jesus, show us the Father and that's good enough. So Moses and Philip, they are not the cleverest bunch. But God in his wonderful mercy said, no one has seen me. No one will see my face and live. I'm saying this so that you don't die. But when Jesus came, the answer was a little bit different, wasn't it? The answer to Philip was not, oh, Philip, you're never going to see God. No. Jesus gave a much better answer than God gave to Moses. Jesus said to Philip, Philip, I mean, first of all, you have been with me for such a long time and you still don't get it. Philip, whoever sees me, sees the Father. So how do you ask me? Show us the Father. Show me the Father. And then John writes here. No one has seen God. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. What a glorious passage we have before us, isn't it? But it's a a very difficult to understand. It's a passage that is very difficult to understand. Let me prove that to you. Let me prove that to you. I'm going to tell you that this passage here is impossible to understand. Let me, let me read to you the first letter that Paul wrote to Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Listen to this. And without controversy, that meaning... No debate about this. Everybody agrees. Great is the mystery. Look at the word. Mystery. Not understanding. Do you know why it's called a mystery? Because, well, because it's a mystery. We don't have total access to that. Great is the mystery of godliness. Now, here's the mystery. God was manifested in the flesh. 
The verse goes on, but I want to focus on this part. I'm preaching to you right now, and I'm going to try to explain to you right now what is impossible to explain and what is possible to fully comprehend. That's one thing that I love about the Bible. That's one thing I love about our faith. That's one thing I love about Christianity. There are portions of Christianity that the Bible itself will say that cannot be fully comprehended. Why? Because if I could understand everything about my God, then that means that he fits in my head. Then, then I'm God, not him. Not him. What we have before us is a mystery. How can God become man, but never seems to be God? And how can man, that man, how can that Jesus also be God? Does that mean that divinity became humanity? No. Does that mean that humanity became divinity? No. But who is Jesus? God. And man. Now, that's the explanation that when you give to a f- class full of students, the only students r- raise their hands and say, I'm sorry, can you say that again? I didn't get it. And that's the student that actually got it. And the teacher would reply, I know why you didn't get it. Because it's ungettable. It's it's not understandable. It is indeed a mystery. And look at this. Look look at verse 14. The word became flesh. This this is the, the statement to end all statements. And let me tell this. For us, this is amazing today. At the time, it was even more amazing. Let me tell you why. Here's what the different philosophers of the time thought. First of all, the idea of of the, the ideal king, the proper king, the king that is how everybody should mirror himself after, is the king... That was considered the living law. He is the law himself. But only as a metaphor. Only as a metaphor. The Stoics. The Stoics saw God as pure intellect. Are they right? Were they right? Well, a little bit. Not too much, but a little bit. A, Platon, a Platonist saw God as unnamed unseen and untouched. Were the Platonists right? A little bit. The Neoplatonists, they saw God as visible through the lives of the wise, but never through a body. Were they right? A a little bit. All of these were right in a certain sense. But Jesus broke everything. Jesus broke the expectations. It is true. God doesn't have a body. Even Jesus said, God is a spirit, not a body, a spirit. But in Jesus, did we see God? Yes. Even Jesus said to Philip, Philip, who sees me, sees the Father. But was that the nose of, was his nose, the color of his eyes? The kind of hair. I wonder if he could, if you'd split his hair on the side, on this side or on the middle, or there was no split on the hair. I, I don't even know if he had hair. That was God. But it looks like a man. Well, that's a man. But I'm confused. So am I. But that's it. The word became flesh. Now, some people try to make this fit in the human mind, they would say, no, then he became 50% God, 50% man. But that's not, that's an aberration. Like, imagine, what, what is half a person? That's nothing, that's not a person. What is half a God? I mean, how, how do you make infinite half? You cannot even measure in the first place. How do you split? So they created a thing that doesn't exist. 
Some, they believe that the attributes of one nature, because they are united in Jesus, that the attributes of one nature kind of mingled with the other nature. I'll give an example. You take the Catholic Mass when they take the bread, the body of Jesus. They say that that is really, 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 really the body of Jesus. And the wine is really, really, really the blood of Jesus. The physical attributes are not changed because the taste is the taste of wine and the taste of bread is the taste of bread. But they actually believe that there is actual God. Oh my goodness, I remember the situation of this poor uh, Catholic priest in Brazil. I, I feel sorry for, this, for this, that particular guy. He was visiting, a, uh, by all counts, I, 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 was, I mean, I believe that he was a, a lovely man. And he was visiting one of his parishioners, as he should, and bringing communion to that parishioner, as he should. And uh, the person was sick in bed. So I think he was trying to arrange something, and he put the, the cup with the, the bread at the window, by the window. You know? And as he was doing something, the wind, a wind came in and caused the window to shut, and the cup fell outside. Guys, this is in the farm, okay? This is in the middle of the bush. And uh, he, of course, was desperate, and he ran around the house. And when he got there, he found that the chicken had eaten a bit of the bread. So he had, he had to abort the whole event. He had to collect the chicken and make sure that he would eat all those chicken because the body of God was there. Look at the situation. That they, I, I felt very sorry for the man. The, 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 his mind was in, in a, I'm sure he was feeling horrible about the, the situation. His faith was in a very difficult spot at that time. But that, that's not what we believe. We believe that divinity never ceases to be divinity. No portion of divinity is penetrated by humanity. And no portion of humanity is penetrated by divinity. We shall never be gods. I think there is a religion that believes that we shall be gods one day. I don't know if it's the Mormons. There is a religion that believes that every person on that religion will eventually be a god and have their own word to rule. No, we shall never be gods. We shall forever be men. And God shall forever be God. He shall never be men. And I remember having this conversation one day with a friend of mine. And we were talking about the, the crucifixion. And I, and I think I said, my, my, what an what a event. God was dying there in the cross. And my friend looked at me and said, God doesn't die. And I, and I thought, wait a minute, but if God doesn't die, then there was a sacrifice of a mere man. How can the sacrifice of a mere man be enough to satisfy the fury of a God? Who was right, my friend or I? And, and then we debated this for a while without realizing that both of us were right. Indeed, God cannot die. God cannot die. That's why this is so crucial. The word became flesh. Because when Jesus, when God, when the Son of God became man, when Jesus was born, he became a, a person that could die. And we needed a person that could die. Because that, the sacrifice of the infinite would be on, the only thing to satisfy an offense made to the infinite God. We needed him to become flesh. And Paul said, great is this mystery. L let me tell you more. Let me tell you more. Paul, I think it was Paul. He said that before the coming of Christ, this was already a mystery. A mystery that the angels wanted to understand. But let me explain this, this portion. They wanted to understand. 
you know how it says in the Greek? That is, the idea there is peek through. You know when children are playing and, uh, and they, they only appear a little bit like that and then go down like this. And they only appear a little bit. So they, they want to see through the wall and they just see and they take a look and come back again. The Greek is that idea. The angels, they wanted to kind of climb the wall and take a look to see how is God going to make it. Men fell, they offended the living God. How is God going to solve that? God is gracious. Yes, but God is just. The angels did not understand it. Even the angels. Now, one angel is smarter than all of us, but together multiplied by a thousand. The angels did not understand it. What a mystery. What a glorious gospel we have. He dwelt. He became flesh and dwelt among us. Do you know what this word means? Dwelt. In Hebrew here is he tabernacled. He pitched his tent. He made his tabernacle. He prepared his tent. That's the word. Dwelt among us. Literally is tabernacled among us. Now, what a, very important here. First of all, what was the tabernacle? The tabernacle was a temporary structure. Jesus came in a temporary humiliation. The tabernacle was a very humble structure. Jesus came in a very humble looking body. The Bible says that people looked at him and they thought nothing of him. They, he was one that was, no, he was a regular Joe. He would pass by you on the streets and you wouldn't think twice. The temple, the temple was a permanent place. The tabernacle was not. The tabernacle would be put here a few months later, unassembled, go to another location and then assembled again. Not a permanent structure. The temple was. The temple was permanent. Where is the temple of Christ? But the Bible speaks of two permanent locations for Christ. Number one, the right hand of God. You can see this in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. Another location that the Bible tells us that is a permanent location for Christ is at the heart of the believer. John chapter 14 speaks of this. When Jesus says, those who believe in me, me, the Holy Spirit and I will come and live on the person. Another one. The tabernacle was the place where the sacrifices were offered. Jesus was that sacrifice. The tabernacle was the place where the family of the priests would eat their portion. Now who are these today? Today the Bible states. The apostle Peter specifically. States that all believers are a form of priests before God. So Jesus is the location where all the believers come for spiritual food. Hallelujah. And we see again, and we beheld his glory. The climax, the apex, the top, the paramount of God's revelation is Jesus. This was happening in Brazil quite a lot recently. Particularly among Pentecostal churches. They were saying often during their service. The God's best is still to come. We are still waiting for God's best. We have not seen the best of God yet. What they usually mean is. God is going to give you more blessings. Maybe more money. More health more success in your business. Usually that's what they mean. But here's the problem. God's best is not going to come. God's best already came. Jesus was the best of God. God already gave his best. Jesus. Anything else is this big. Jesus is the best 
of God. Jesus is the embodied law. He is the God of Israel. Isaiah chapter 42 verse 8 says, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. And here's John is, here John is saying, we beheld his glory. Well, Isaiah said that God said that he would not give his glory to another. But here's John saying, oh, we saw the glory of Jesus, all right. John is saying, that's God. That's God. Look at this. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. The glory of the one that shares the same nature of God, of the Father. And then he continues, full of grace and truth. Who can say, who can call themselves full of grace? Some Catholics would say that Mary could. Remember when the angel appeared to Mary and said, Rejoice, O most favored one. In, 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 in Portuguese, the, the, the Hail Mary prayer goes something like this. Hail Mary, full of grace. That's how it begins, full of grace. But that was not what the angel actually told Mary, isn't it? What the angel told her is, you are full of grace on the sense that you received that grace. Highly favored. So you are the one that passively received the grace. Now when we talk about Jesus here, Jesus is not the one receiving the grace. He is the source of grace. Full of grace and Truth. Remember Pontius Pilate talking to Jesus. And Jesus was talking about the truth. And Pontius Pilate asked, what is truth? Well, we know today what is truth. We know today. On verse 27, let me skip. I'm going to come back, but let me skip to verse, 20, verse 17. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. On verse 17... The translation, I'm, I'm, I'm no Greek scholar, by no means at all, but I, I really wish that they would have translated the grace and the truth. If you read this in Greek, you see the articles there. It is, it is something like John is presenting truth and grace, not as concepts, but as persons, but as entities. He said, the grace, the truth, were given by Jesus. But also, isn't that what Jesus said? He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Lord but by me. No one comes to the Father but through me. So Jesus is saying that, that grace, that truth, those two very important things, I am those things. It's not that I have those things. No, 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 no. I am those things. You, you may call that, but that's me. They exist because of me. Guys, it's very important that we understand this about God. When we say God is beautiful. Which is true. But here's the thing. We know the concept of beauty. Not because we know beauty and then we say, oh, we see that in God. No, 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 no. It's the other way around. We see God and there we find something that we behold and we see. Well, that is amazing. What are you going to call that? Let's call that beauty. So from there the concept comes. So it's not that God has beauty. Or not even that God is beautiful. It's that God is beauty. And Jesus is saying, I am grace. I am truth. Now, if you may notice, 
If we put the words together, grace and truth, what are these two things? Grace and truth, despair. What is despair for me? Like, like when you make a cake, right? You have the ingredients, um, flour, I think sugar, butter, eggs. I think uh, the, 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 the thing that make to rise, right? The, the, that, that, that little powder that you put a little bit and cause it to, to yeast, to, to rise, and maybe a little bit of chocolate on top, and I'm getting hungry. So, so do you have the ingredients that form the cake? What are these two ingredients for me? What, what is this grace and truth? If you put them together, what do you have? The gospel. That's it. This is the gospel. Have you noticed? The gospel is this. The grace of God. So that we see the activity. Here's what's grace. Grace is the forgiving activity of God. When God actively forgives somebody, he displays his grace. What is the truth? Well, the truth is the theoretical elements that guide that activity. So you have the theory and the practice. Theory, the truth, the practice, the grace. What are these two things together? Oh, the gospel. Or more precisely, Jesus. Jesus is the theory of God. Jesus is the activity of God. Remember when Jesus said, My father works until now, and so do I. The activity of God. Here's the theory of God. Jesus said, I only speak what I see, what my father gives me to speak. The theory of God. In John verse 8, 15, John the Baptist, not, not, not John the altar, John the Baptist, bore witness of him. Once again, John, the author of the gospel, is bringing the greatest prophet of that time, which was John the Baptist, as a, a witness. In, here's the trial. The world want to condemn Jesus. But what does Jesus have on his side? What is Jesus' defense? What are those that will witness that Jesus is actually God? John the Baptist, the greatest prophet of that time. The most respected man in any religious circle of Israel was John the Baptist. And he bore witness. He said, this was he. This is the guy that I've been talking to you guys about. He who comes after me, chronologically. Who was older, John the Baptist or Jesus? Oh, it depends. John the Baptist was born on day X. And six months later, Jesus was born. They were cousins, by the way. So six months later, Jesus was born. So that's why he's saying, he who comes after me, so John is saying, I, I arrived first. Jesus came after me. I'm six months ahead. He who comes after me is preferred before me. Now he's not talking about the chronology. He's talking about the preeminence. He is more important than me. Why? For he was before me. Now he's going back to the chronology. The one who arrived after me actually existed since time began. So, yeah, so he comes before me. So the one that came after me came before me. Th that's what he's saying of Jesus. And then we come to verse 16. And we see John speaking of Jesus as the source. Look at this. Of his fullness... We have all received in grace for grace. What is this? Grace for grace. The expression means one on top of the other. It's something like, and from him we received grace and more grace and more grace and a bit more grace with more grace on the side, with more grace on top, and as much grace as you need. That's the point that he's trying to make. From his, but how can he give so much grace? Well, because he's full of it. His fullness, verse 16, from his fullness, we have all received. 
Here's, guys, here's something that is so encouraging for us. Often we think that we cannot really have a wonderful relationship with God because our sins are plenty. And that is true. Here's something that is bigger. This grace here. This grace here. Our sins are something that we have committed. But the fullness of grace of God is something that he is. We are not sin. We commit sin. But when it comes to Jesus, he is grace. Not that he commits it. Not that he has a measure of it. He is the grace. How? And here are your sins of a specific capacity. Here's Jesus, infinite. And how much grace does he give? Look at this. Grace for grace. Meaning as much as you need. As much as is necessary. So when we relate with God, to God, we can relate with confidence. We can pray confidently because our sins are forgiven through Christ. What does fullness really mean? Well, it means fullness. It means full. It means all of it. It means complete. It means up to the full measure. Now, the grace, and Philip, but how, how do you experience this grace? How does this grace that is so full, that is on top, on top, on top, on top, on top, how does that come to us? Now comes another mystery. Full of mysteries today. Huh? The mystery number one was how can God be man? And how can man be also God? How can those two, divinity and humanity, be in one person? That's a mystery. Now here's a second mystery. It's called union with Christ. Theologians have always called this the mystical union with Christ. So how can all the grace of Jesus come to me? Well, that's easy. He unites himself to us. He tangled himself with us. And isn't that what he prayed? Isn't that what Jesus himself prayed? He said, Oh Father, that they may be one with me as I am one with you. Think about that. How connected is the born again believer to Jesus? It's impossible to answer because they're united to the point of being called one. So, how united is that? Totally. Here, here's a comparison. That is not enough. I'm, I'm going to give you a comparison. And after I'm done with the comparison, I'm going to tell you that my comparison is wrong. Because it's not enough. Have you mixed, have you mixed coffee with milk? Sure you have. You're a good person. You have done that. Can you unmix those things? When you mix coffee and milk, the mix is so complete that it cannot be unmixed. Here's my comparison. Now I'm going to complain about my own comparison. It's not enough. It's not complete enough. It's not... Fair enough, the comparison. Why? Because when you mix coffee and milk, that thing becomes a third thing. It's no longer coffee, it's no longer milk. It's the third thing you made. But when God mixes with us, when Jesus is united to us, I stay I. <laughs> I am still me. I, I, I am me. And Jesus is still Jesus. But how tangled are we? Even more than coffee mixed with milk. Then comes the question, how does the grace of God come to me? Well, now the answer becomes even, the question becomes kind of stupid, isn't it? Well, 
If I'm completely united to Jesus, how could the grace of God not be with me? Now, who is the fullness? Look at this. And of his fullness. So he has all the grace. And where I am in relation to him. United to him. Now then all the grace is mine because I am in him. Dear believer, if you are a believer, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you call upon God for salvation, I can say you are a believer. And when you die, you shall embrace Christ in heaven. Dear believer, how much does God love you? The answer is obvious, isn't it? If I am united to Christ, if Christ and I are made one through this mystical, profound, and mysterious union, God loves me the same amount that he loves Jesus. Because I am united to Jesus. Because I am united to Jesus, all that belongs to Jesus belongs to me. And guys, I'm not making this up. You can read this right there in the Bible. Verse 17, for the law was given through Moses. Indeed, the ceremonial law and the moral law have been very well codified through the ministry of Moses. A fantastic man with a fantastic ministry that may have lasted about 40 years, depends on how you count it. But here's one thing. Have you ever read on the Bible that Moses saved somebody? I never read that. Have you read on the Bible that Moses killed somebody? Yeah, I, I read. There was an Egyptian fighting with a Jew one once, and they were fighting badly, and Moses saw the situation, and Moses bah, killed the Egyptian. He had to run away from the nation. He had to run away and live in exile for 40 years. From when he was 40 until he was 80. That was his life. Exile. I imagine the man to be depressed out of his mind during those 40 years. Nevertheless, through that man came the law. Moses brought the law. The law that condemned me. The law that condemned you. He brought that. Jesus, Jesus brought grace. Did Moses ever save anyone? No. What about Jesus? Did Jesus ever lose anyone that he wanted to save? No. Look, the point that John is trying to make here is not, look at Moses. No, 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 no. The point is, Moses, the greatest of the Old Testament, Moses, the, the prophet Moses. He only brought the law. But look at Jesus. He brought the grace. The grace. And the truth. But here's the thing. Here's the part that is amazing. Did Moses lie to the people of Israel? No. So Moses brought truth as well. So why doesn't seem to be fair here? Moses also brought the truth. Why is saying that truth came through Jesus and not through Moses also? Here's the thing. Moses brought truth, but not the truth. You see the difference here? To be honest, Moses even brought a little bit of grace. Because when God gives the law, he is giving a revelation of himself. Because the law speaks of God. And that is grace. So, did Moses bring grace? Yeah. Did Moses bring the grace? No. It was only Jesus. And now we come to verse 18, and we see, no one has seen God at any time. Another obvious reference to Exodus, right? Moses, God, can I see you, God? No. 
No one has seen God. But, but Jesus showed us God. And now I want to end this sermon with the last sentence of this verse. The only begotten son, what is, by the way, what is this begotten? The one that proceeds from God eternally. That means that Jesus, that the son of God was born. Now Jesus was born, not the son of God. The second person of the Trinity proceeds from the father from eternity. The third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, proceeds from the second and the first from eternity. How does that work? To proceed from someone eternally. I have not a clue. I know how it is. But I don't have a clue. Now I know what it is. But I don't have a clue of how that could possibly be. So that one, the only begotten son, who is in the bosom of the father. The bosom, who is right there, at the closest that one can be of the father. He has declared him. What is this declaration? The Greek word here is awesome. The Greek word here is exegesis. You know what this word is. This word is a word commonly found among people that study textual interpretation. Here's what exegesis is. To exegete a text is to look at the text carefully, explain, analyze the text Carefully and explain the text in detail. That's exegesis. What I did with you, just exegesis is what I've been doing since I began preaching today. I went through verse 14 and I explained all the details, right? Verse 15, 16, 17, 18. I'm explaining all the details. I'm saying what it is and I'm explaining what it means. That's what we call what we call exegesis. That's an English word. The Greek word here is exegesis. So he's saying, this passage is saying that Jesus is the exegesis of the Father. Jesus is the explanation of God. Do you want to analyze God? Analyze Jesus. Do you want to comprehend God? Comprehend Jesus. Do you want to get to know God? Get to know Jesus. That's what it says here. Jesus is the explanation of God. Let's say you want to learn the Portuguese language. On this, if the Portuguese language were God, Jesus would be something like the dictionary. Explain. What does that mean? Let me see. Here's the word. Here's the detailed explanation. Jesus is the detailed explanation of God. Can anyone come to the Father but through Jesus? No. That's why, as believers, we must be totally confident that there is only one way. Guys, there is only one way to the Father. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Now imagine if you want to visit a king in a very important country. Imagine that. Let's say you go to Thailand, a country that I like very much, and you want to visit the king. I know the king died recently, but let's imagine not. The longest living monarch, I think, in history, in recorded history, was the king of Thailand that died recently. And when I was in Thailand, I asked a whole lot of people, do you like the king? I, did not, I asked a whole lot of people. I did not find one guy or lady that said, eh, not so much. No, they all said, I do. Let's say you travel to Thailand and you want to visit the king. But you have a problem. First of all, you're not even Thai yourself, are you? You're not even a citizen of Thailand. You're just a tourist. You just arrived. How are you going to see the king? Your chances are a perfect round zero. But let's say the prince is walking by. 
And the prince looks at you in your sad, miserable state. Because there you are at the gate trying to enter. And boy, oh boy, there's not a chance that you're coming through. And then the king, the prince looks at you and say, hey, what's up? I want to see the king. Oh, he's my father. Oh, that's fantastic. Would you take me to the king? Oh, they're not going to let you in. Well, then can I not see the king? I'll take you there. Come here. Let me put my hand on your shoulder. Stay close to me. I'll take you all the way to the room, to the throne room. How about that? There you are. Inside the throne room of the king. Why? The prince took you there. Let us pray. Oh, blessed be your name, O Lord God Almighty. For you are good. So good. Your best already came. And it was called Jesus. And Lord, in our sins and trespasses, we crucified him. Forgive us, O Lord. And Lord, we bless your name. For not only those who call upon you are forgiven, but they are united to your very son. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, blessed be your name. For you are great and kind and most compassionate. Lord, may we love you forever. May we worship you forever. May we adore you and serve you and listen to you and obey you and enjoy you and be happy with you forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.